I think you can get most of it. Uh, the Lexian is now in standard US, or standard green rather than the old, um, what was it, the Challenger, the class Challenger colours. Um, but you can't get the Aryan tractors, the 400 and the 600. But they do now sell the Axians over here. I don't know how successful they're being because I don't think it's particularly a um, a brand that American farmers associate with. Um, but you know, I've seen over down in Ohio, Amish country, there's a guy who runs, looks like he runs a fairly heavy fent farm. Um, I saw him running a you know, saw at least a, a tractor with some implements on the back uh, running down towards his farm and then like 10 minutes later a different fent tractor came back um, with some different equipment on the back so um, you know fence no and it's not common I think commonality in the US is probably John Deere and Case But then you get the the smaller farms, which will use anything they can get their hands on. But yeah, look at look at websites for ideas, or look look at manufacturers' websites for ideas on what what sold where. So the the Amazon Cedar that I was using. I actually looked it up on Amazon because I thought it's a little bit too good to be true but it turned out that it wasn't it was a real cedar but it's not sold in Europe so we switched to Cavernum DLC um, equipment up putting a lot, of, a lot of sugar beets back here sometime soon and then the other thing to look is to go on YouTube and, and hunt around to see um, what other we'll lower that so it looks at least a little bit realistic But yeah, look for um, videos on YouTube for UK farming uh, or European farming, and you'll find you'll find some interesting stuff out there. Um, you know, it it seems there's a lot of contractors who own big equipment. So you know, as an example, I've stated before, Ollie's farm. He doesn't have any fertilizing equipment, but he outsources that contract to a guy who has a self-propelled sprayer. Now, I don't know if that guy has anything other than the self-propelled sprayer, and um, he just has enough work um, that warrants him keeping that self-propelled sprayer, but, you know, that guy does the spraying for probably a number of farms around Norfolk, possibly even Suffolk, um, in order to cover the costs of using that large piece of equipment. But it's a large piece of equipment that most of the farms in that area just couldn't justify owning. Um, similarly with sugar beet farming, um, you know, the farmers will generally outsource the sugar beet um, harvesting to some company that owns a sugar beet harvester and a couple of large uh, um, tippers that they can haul the sugar beets in and a couple of large tractors that they can haul the large tippers with. So a lot of farmers in 
at least in the UK, possibly in Europe, have the equipment that they need for day to day and will then hire out um, for their larger needs. And good morning Whitehawk, how are you doing on this Saturday? So, we'll lower that there, move forward a little bit and release. release. There we go. And it will magically stay exactly where I put it. Okay, what else do I need to do? We need a bale. This is not a bale fork, my dog. So I'm going to put this tractor away for now. I think we've we put everything away. We put everything away. So it's all good. We've moved the uh, wall, which means we won't get uh, messages complaining that we have no more room for wool. And I think the other thing I have noticed, and not just for um, European farms, but across the world, a lot of farmers will be brand loyal. And that's primarily because you can take all of your equipment into one shop and you deal with them for everything. You buy your stuff there, you buy your spares from there, and you whoop, crash into the ramp. Um, now, actually. We have 92,002% compacted. Oh, yeah, I've had some of that lately. Not sleeping well. I'm not sleeping as badly as I have in the past, but sometimes... No, oh, where are we going? I'm going to go forwards. But yeah, I mean, it's, I mean, me, I've got a Saab SUV and a Saab car, and I take them all to the same guy. Um, and he's had both of them this week. Uh, the the SUV has been having a little bit of a problem with its air conditioning and we took that in the beginning of the week and they uh, flushed the system and everything's fine and wonderful and uh, we got it back and then a couple of days in it was sort of yeah not happening um, that didn't fix it I took that back on Thursday and um, turns out he took it out for a test drive and as soon as he started playing up he said oh yeah clutch on a lot of the the fans that cool the engine and pump air into the air conditioner uh, the clutch is a shot need replacing so okay fine we can do that um, and between the two visits for the SUV the car was in because it's been steering heavy it turns out this is quite a common thing for uh, for vehicles when um, how do I do this? Oh, that's as high as it goes. Okay. Um, vehicles that have been parked in the garage for um, six months because nobody can go anywhere. Um, the steering had. Uh, seized up and so um, they had to replace part of it um, let's reverse into that thing again because it's such a wise man plan to do okay I'm now going to do a little bit of
Oh, that that would help. <laughs> yeah. That thing has an angle and a... Uh... Oh, I don't want that. Let's raise it so no, that is... That's as raised as it goes, but it's got an angle and a... Um, and uh, raise and lower. So, actually, whoops, and keeping doing that. So I'm pressing the wrong button. Okay, I'm going to drop that there. And we'll just do it tractor free. Someone is charging me for things that don't happen. Um, I'm confused. Well, no, I mean, the thing is, is no, the air conditioning has been playing up. Uh, yeah, they flush the system, but it turns out there's no cold air going, or there's no air going into the air conditioner in, to be cooled in order to uh, cool off the cabin. And that's. And they go with what, the, what I tell them. They, there's. Um, with the car, the steering was heavy, so that could be the. Um, the power steering fluid was low and it turned out that wasn't no um, what my mechanic was telling me was that um, you know some of their older vehicles my, my vehicles 10 years old and uh, and using it day in and day out it doesn't get time to seize up because of the corrosion but the car has been sat in the garage for pretty much five months and that gave a chance for the corrosion to actually affect its handling and so and he said yeah he was saying they've they've had a surprising number of vehicles with that particular problem because the vehicles have been sitting around for five months because nobody's going anywhere you know, even two car families we we are we are a two car family although we could get away with one vehicle i've had you know so we have a car and we have an suv well we've been driving the suv around almost solidly because we don't yeah you know, we don't need both vehicles out and when we have the kids over we need the suv and when we don't have the kids over it's just easier to put the shopping in the uh, in the back of the suv so, yeah, the car has been driving around on Michigan roads for 10 years and has, I bought it new. It has 140,000 miles on it, so that's 140,000 miles of Michigan winters with salt on the roads and all the rest of it, and it is going to cause corrosion. But, um, yeah, that's now fixed. And I can tell that's been fixed. We also have a problem with the, the door sensors on the SUV. And is basically, you know, when you get, get to your destination, turn the ignition off, you open the door, the radio goes off. Well, that doesn't always happen on our SUV. Most of the time it does, but there's every so often the radio doesn't turn off and that concerns me. Not because the radio doesn't turn off, but what else isn't turning off? Because I don't really want to uh, 
get out of the, the car or get out of the truck, not realise that the radio hasn't turned off because I haven't got it turned on for some reason. And then the car sits there for a few hours with other electrical equipment running, draining the battery and potentially leaving me unable to start the car. So um, it's a concern, um, but they haven't been able to find the cause of that yet. So it's a case of what we're doing is when we take it out for a test drive after making changes or whatever. So once they've replaced the clutches on the the engine fans, cooling fans, um, they'll probably take it out on a test drive just to make sure it's working. And you know, there's the chance that they get to the end, they open the door, the radio doesn't turn off, and at that point it's a case, okay, get the diagnostic equipment, do not shut the door. Um, let's find out what the um, what the uh, control computer in the car is is registering. Does it see the door is open, or is the door sensor broken, or something like that? But uh, my guy does what needs to be done. He doesn't look for extra work, and he doesn't have to. Because, you know, he, he's built up a solid enough reputation with all of his customers. And they're always going to come back to him. He knows if, if he does something that somebody doesn't like, they're not coming back. So, we'll see. As it is, he's got the SUV for today. Well, for until at least Monday. And we're going to be using the car, which is good. I, I, I missed using the car for a while. So it's just easier. Um, and we don't have working garage door openers. So to you know, get the vehicles out, put them away, we have to get out the car and open or close the door. Um, I have a Saab 97X which is basically a Chevy Trailblazer with um, a different badge on the front and wheels and steering and stuff and back. But, uh, yeah, because, because of the challenges with the, uh, the garage door, when you know, once we put a car in the garage, we're, it's easier to use the one that we didn't put away is to uh, get one out and it's only was it a couple of weeks ago when there was the event going on at church and I had to work and my wife went Mrs. Osa went to church to help with the event and so she took one vehicle and I had to take the other one when I finished working so I had to get the car out so fun driving the car. Oh, this is taking its time. How are we doing? Oh, oh, we're nearly done. I will leave the help desk or oh, the help screen open so we can. We only need to do this for as much as we need to do it. to 100 before, yes, we're out of here, boom, and we'll cover that over instantly, we'll then move this over here,
this going to be? Oops. Well, that's an improvement, I guess. And it still kind of looks realistic, so. Whoops. Not so realistic. There, I'll put that one in front. Oh, that's getting a little bit upset. There now. It's not wobbling around. I think for that, I'm going to have to turn strong man on for a minute. Turned on. I'm going to jump into the tractor so that I have a better view of what that looks like. Oh, I think that's good enough. Good. So we are done with the mowing. We're done with the, the silage thing. Um, probably close the gate even though we don't have cows. Good. And let's maybe check on contracts. Uh, transporting, transporting, fertilizing 27, and that pays. Okay, we'll put the uh, Last tractor away then, since everything we want to do is done for now. I think with um sort of Chrysler, Jeep, Dodge. It depends where your vehicle is built. There have been a lot of horror stories from Chrysler manufacturers based around Detroit. Um, and the fact that maybe in the morning when your car, if, if your, your car was built in the morning, it should be relatively okay if it was built in the afternoon it might not be square or very well put together because of uh, what the uh, workers do at lunch times now, i'm not sure that's still a problem I'm, I've, I've been living in michigan for 10 years so it used to be a problem. I don't know if it's still a problem or what, but uh, it's definitely something that can be an issue. So if your vehicle's not built in Detroit and is a Chrysler, it might be of better quality than uh, if it was. Okay, we want liquid fertilizer, I believe. This is liquid fertilizer. Okay, that was from the tank at the back. Hopefully that's from the tank at the front. Yes. Um, I really don't think I need much more than 1100 litres in this. So we'll run with what we've got. Now, I need to go to field 27. Where is that? Um, that's the one. 
all the way at the top. So we go down to a Glen Farm, take a right. But I have worked with Dodge vehicles. I, I actually, the vehicles I find most uncomfortable tend to be Ford. Um, and at least back in the UK, it's sort of, since my grandfather worked for Ford, our family does qualify for discounts for as long as my grandmother is still alive. So, uh, you know, a lot, a lot of the vehicles we bought in our family's younger years was um, were Fords because we got the family discount. But as I said, my dad dri drives an Audi now, and he likes that. My mum likes that, and that's usually the important thing. And. Uh, Yeah, I drive Saabs. Because I like them. But uh, Dodge trucks are very good. They got a very good turn circle. At least 10 years ago, they were... They, they compared very favorably with other trucks um, in, with, with the ability to turn in tight areas so yeah if you were going to run this farm with a pickup truck Dodge would probably work better than a Ford or a, a Chevy now I know with you know obviously with similar vehicles from different manufacturers they're always bringing out new models that try and do something, you know, do more than their uh, competitors do. But, uh, yeah, back, back when I was younger, I used to watch Top Gear, and Top Gear used to be a, a car magazine rather than Toys for the Boys. And as a car magazine show, they would review vehicles. They do side by side comparisons between similar vehicles from different manufacturers. So, you know, the family car. Did I drive past the farm? No. Or the car that all the sales reps drive around in. Or. You know, the family SUV or the family minivan or whatever but they they would they would actually take out normal vehicles and 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 do a vehicle report on it much like you would find if you bought um, a magazine to do with cars or whatever but um, there was one year um, Jeremy Clarkson had to do a review on the brand new GM, whatever it was that sales reps drive. That style of vehicle. UK, obviously. And so, yeah, he told us about yeah, how many cup holders it has and how fuel efficient it was. And how many, you know, how big the trunk was, as a, thus how much samples you could fit in the trunk um, as you were going on your sales um, calls. And at the end, at the end of each one, the the uh, the presenter who was driving the vehicle would generally get out of the car, and they would stand, face the camera, and extol the virtues of what the car did really good and maybe what the car did really bad. And Jeremy got out of this particular car and he stood and he looked at his, the, the camera and he drummed his fingers on the, uh, the roof of the car 
And after about 20 seconds, he said, well, that just about sums up this car. <laughs> and walked away. <laughs> and the basic, you know, thing was, this car is average. It does nothing exceptionally better than any of its competition. But similarly, it doesn't do anything worse than the rest of its competition. It's just a car. <laughs> and that was pretty much what his, uh, his summary brought over to the viewing public. And GM were furious. Because, you know, you didn't have anything to say. This is, you know, it's almost the death knell for a, you know, for a car manufacturer. If, if somebody doesn't have anything to say about your car, not good or bad, that's just not good.